Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and to our podcast. We're now in the second Sunday in Lent, and uh, now we'll be talking about the epistle for the day. And uh, the epistle chosen for this day is from Paul's letter to the Romans, and it's the fifth chapter. Now, this marks a transition in the epistle. Uh, really, the first, I guess, four chapters are focused upon justification. And Paul shows, of course, that um, none of us can be made right by our own righteousness. And this is true for the Jew and the Gentile. The law shows us our sin. Uh, but also then that we are justified by grace um, through faith in Christ Jesus, a familiar theme uh, from Paul's epistles. And he closes out this section at the end of chapter 4 by saying that... Um, we, we, we receive the justification in Christ Jesus who was handed over for our trespasses and who was raised for our justification. And that's the end of the section. Now in chapter 5, we get the results of justification and we get a beginning look at what the Christian life will look, what, what, what it will look like. And um, admittedly, the Christian life, while full of joy, is also full of hardship and difficulty which is a theme of uh, Lent. Um, I think this fits in well with the reading for the beginning of Lent where Christ, having been um, spent, having been baptized, is then thrown out into the desert by the Holy Spirit, and it's there he faces the trials and temptations. So also the Christian, having been justified by faith, so also will face trials and temptations. So we look at chapter uh, 5 and we begin... As we said, uh, this really summarizes the entirety of the first four chapters dealing with justification. Having therefore been justified, the error is passive, therefore, and how were we justified? By faith, ekpisteos, having been justified by faith, um, apart from works, what do we now have? We have peace toward God. That's, we've been reconciled to God, we are at peace with God. We can go to sleep at night no longer worrying about our sins or no longer having to justify ourselves before God for we have peace towards God on account of through our Lord Jesus Christ who gives us this peace. Now, um, as we go forward then in, in verse 2, through whom, de, who, through whom, uh, that is Jesus Christ, we common we have or have gained uh, access. We have gained access to where or by, by faith, into, into this grace, charis, karin, in which we now, now here is a, a perfect form of the verb to, uh, to stand, in which we have stood and therefore in which we stand. So we have access, or we have gained access, it says, uh, by faith into the grace in which we now stand. Now this is a wonderful teaching because it means we are now standing in a state of grace, which is to say we have a new relationship. We're not always looking over our shoulders. We're not worried. We're not simply employees, and this is what's going to come out later uh, that's our baptismal status. Instead of being employees of God, we're actually sons of God. Uh, we live in a state of grace. That means with every sin that we commit, it's not as if, oh no, we're, we've lost our justification or we've lost our status before God. Uh, we stand now in the grace of God confidently. And that affects the way we think about our lives, that we know where we belong within the grace of of God, and now the boasting begins. Well, what kind of boasting? And we boast of the hope of the glory of God. So we have our future. When it, because we stand in the grace of God, therefore our future is firm, it is secure, and now we boast in the hope of the glory of God, and the glory of God uh, it really begins, I suppose, uh, with the resurrection that uh, as, as we have been in Christ's death, so also his resurrection is our justification. It is our new standing before God. 
and it is our hope. Now, this does not mean, as we boast in the hope of the glory of God, that our life now will be easy, uh, far from it. Um, in fact, it explains why, though, we can have joy in the midst of difficulty, because now he moves forward, because uh, ooh, Mona, not only that, but we boast. What do we boast in? Besides boasting in the hope, we also now boast in the tribulations. This is slips this. Uh, tribulations, th the word in Greek, slips this, it's, it's the pressing in. When you feel the world pressing in on you, when you feel like they're coming at you from all sides, when the difficulty is when you're between the Scylla, Scylla and Charybdis, Scylla and Charybdis, sorry, um, when they, on both sides they're coming at you, we're in the midst of the tribulation. Well, we boast in that, knowing that this thlipsis, this tribulation, now here, here's that great word for works. Paul loves it. Thoroughly works patience. So when we're in the difficulties of life, and Lent is a time of difficulties, it's a time of deprivation, it's our time in the wilderness, it's our time of testing. Uh, how shall we think about our time of testing when the difficulties come? Well, when you think about your testing, recognizing that, recognize that God is working in and through you. This is part of what it means to be developed in, in terms of character. The Christian character is developed in difficult times. And now we see this kind of string along. So, And this patience, as I said, now the verb falls, it, it's understood here. So this patience works testedness, and this testedness brings hope. And this is so important. This is why um, Christians are in some ways allowed to suffer, because there must be Christians among us who have gone through the fire and through difficulties so that they might be encouragement to us that we might be encouragers of those younger Christians. Um, I think about this, for instance, in marriage. It's important that those who have been through uh, you know, a longer marriage can then uh, help those who are younger in their marriage to, to uh, hang in there and be tough and to persevere according to God's good will. As they say, sometimes it's you have to get through the hard stuff to get to the good stuff. And that's true with a lot of life. And in the difficult times, we learn patience. And that patience produces a kind of attestedness, which is character. You want somebody who's not going to panic, who knows life can present difficulties. Um, that's why a pastor in some way uh, is a father figure to his people because he understands these things. This is why we have elders in the church that we go to. Uh, maybe pastors who have gone through this, and members of our congregation who have suffered um, illness or have been gone through trying times because they will have that testedness or that character. And that character reminds us that God intends for us better things, which again brings us to hope, hope as opposed to despair. So there is a future for us, and we, we learn from Christ's own suffering in, in that way. Now, uh, we should know then, as we move from uh, elpida, uh, hope, but now we have it back again, but hope, that's the subject of this sentence in, in uh, verse 5, hope does not karaskune. Now, this is, I think, mistranslated sometimes. Um, Sometimes they say hope does not disappoint. You know, things are going to work out. Really, uh, more precisely, it's hope does not put to shame. And a lot of people will, you know, they will, uh, they will despair because they hate to look bad. So you hate to get your hopes up. And if you get your hopes up and it doesn't work out, then you look foolish. Uh, but this is the Christian life is that we have a sure hope in Christ now, while we live here on this earth, it's all about shame. So when you think about Christ on the cross, it's all about the mockery. Uh, he saved others, but he cannot 
save himself. If he's truly the son of God, let him come down from the cross. Uh, and the crown of thorns, all of that is putting Christ to shame. And even today, for the Christian, we are mocked and ridiculed for what we believe um, in terms of Christ and in terms of uh, the Christian life. Uh, the world makes sport of us, uh, but we should not be in any way uh, put off by that or stopped or we keep going because hope, we know that our hope will not put to shame. On the last day, our Lord will come in riding on the clouds and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus was Lord. And this is part of the vindication. Part of justification is being proven in the end, hey, he was right all along. And we need to encourage our, our people, uh, persevere, continue to make the good fight, uh, faith, continue to make the good confession, because on the last day, uh, you will be justified before the people and you will be vindicated. Uh, they will say, yeah, um, this was the correct path overall, uh, all along, and that's the path of Christ who is the way, the truth and the life. So hope does not disappoint, this hope that we have, because now the love uh, of God has been, is poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. So now what exactly is this love of God that's poured into our hearts? In some ways, I and mean, this could be Eucharistic as far as the, the cup of blessing, which we drink. Um, it could also be... Uh, sacramental in, in terms of baptism that um, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, St. Paul says that uh, they all went through the Red Sea and they all drank of the same spirit, the spirit of Christ. Um, the, and th there is something about baptism also in which we receive the spirit internally and it's poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us. Now we shift our attention a little bit in verse 6, and it talks about Christ's atoning work. So, uh, for still, um, uh, Christ uh, died for the, I guess here it is, being, here's a good genitive absolute, with us being, while we were weak, while we were sick, for Christ, while we were sick or weak still, at the right time, he died for the uh, asebon, which is the, the ungodly, the impious. So, um, so great of, is God's love for us that while we were still impious, so well, before we went to church, before we called Jesus Lord, before the Spirit was poured into our hearts, before anything we could have that would commend ourselves to God, Christ then uh, died for us in our weakness. Now, this is a strange thing. So, um, in verse 7, he comments a little bit on, you know, what, what does the world think of it? Because the world always wants to get something out of you. The world always is uh, acts in self-interest. In fact, almost all of philanthropy is based on self-interest, that I want to make a name for myself. So, I'll give you money, we'll build a building, you can name it after me, and that's all fine. Um, but so much is about uh, we try to accrue power and prestige and money. Um, Jesus says, uh, greater love has no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. Well, this is even maybe more than that because uh, perhaps, perhaps, molus, uh, on behalf of, so it's a good kind of atoning for the sake of word, perhaps for a righteous man, I mean, this is a good guy, somebody might die. Now, that's, that's true. For instance, we do see noble acts um, by policemen, firemen, uh, certainly soldiers on the battlefield uh, trying to save someone. Perhaps for a righteous person, someone might die. And then he, he says it again in another way, that uh, 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 for, uh, 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 for a good for a good person, an agathu, again, uh, for chance, by chance, again, might, someone might, told my, someone might, told my, might dare to die. It's possible that does happen, that people will die for the good, that perhaps a mother will die for her child, that um, a policeman will put himself in harm's way. We do see that. 
and we're amazed by it and we give it great honor. But God's love is even greater than that. For God, here's our subject, a little bit further down the line, he established, so he established his, how to agape, he established his love for us, that at he still, another that genitive absolute, that while we were still sinners, Christ died huper hemon on our behalf. This is it's good Eucharistic language. My body given for you, my blood shed on account of you, on your behalf. So while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. So he didn't wait for us to make the first move. He didn't wait till we were worthy, but he went out and did it out of his own love and grace, compassion and mercy. Therefore, therefore in verse 9, um, Polo, by how much rather, verse 9, having been dikaiothentus, having been justified now, and then we see the payment that makes justification possible in his blood. So don't lose heart because this gets back to the hope. Will we be saved? How much more will we be saved from him, from the orges, from the wrath? Now, um, this reminds us that there's you know, different aspects of salvation. In one sense, it's common to say, I've been saved. In another sense, of course, the final salvation does not come till the end of the age when we truly are saved from the devil and from the world and you know, just as much from our own sinful self that we're released from this body of sin. We are saved. And it's interesting, we're saved from the orgase, the wrath. This goes back in, in Romans, talking about the wrath of God. And um, I think we need to talk about that because I mean, I'm struck by how little talk there is of God's wrath over sin. And I think that's one of the reasons people are not um, rightfully afraid of God. We should fear, love, and trust God above all things. And I, I fear that uh, our people do not fear God because... They think of him only as the giver of good things, but not as the one who will judge all of us on that last day. So we go through this season of Lent in uh, sobriety and recognition of our own sin and the need for repentance, the need to gather in sackcloth and ashes for all that we've done and that we've left undone. Uh, now this is confidence, though, having been justified in this blood, we will be saved from that wrath. And that's the most important wrath there is, or I would say that's the, most con that's the consequence and it's a real consequence that we need to be aware of. But because of Christ, we are justified and we will be saved from that wrath. Now, if then being enemies, and we indeed were enemies, ekthroi, if being we have been reconciled to God, again, now how are we reconciled? Not because of we said we're sorry, uh, but through the death of his son. So his death made the payment, that's the atonement, and because of Christ's death, we have been then brought together with God, how much more than having been reconciled will we be saved? So again, salvation will be saved in his life. And this death to life is established. We are brought together in his death. We are reconciled to God in Christ's death, and then we shall be saved in his life. Now, how this happens uh, to the Christian is going to be outlined later in chapter 6 in which baptism becomes the way by which we are brought then into his death and into his resurrection. And not only that, but now we get back to this boasting, but also boasting in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, through whom, that is through Christ, right now, even now, we have Elabam, uh, we have uh, received, we have received the reconciliation. And that's what we rejoice in today. It's a, it's a text of reconciliation and of hope and of the grace of God in which we stand. And it's a re recognition during this time of Lent that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a time of difficulty that we live in. It's also a time of repentance over our own sin. Um, 
And yet uh, we should not, never despair, for in the difficult times our Lord is building character, and we should never lose hope. Because of our Lord loved us so much then, um, while we were still sinners, while we were rebels against his will, how much more now, um, how much more closely does he hold us, and he will never let us go, for we have received this reconciliation. Well, thank you, and I, uh, I wish you and your congregation a blessed Lent.